I'm excited to have Jim Morningstar join me today. Dr. Jim Morningstar received his Ph.D. in clinical psychology from Fordham University. Jim is a pioneer in the field of breathwork. He began using it in his clinic transformations over 40 years ago. Jim has written five books on breathwork. Hi, Jim. Welcome to the Happy Hippie Healer Speaks. (laughs) I'm so glad to join you, Mary Jo, because having a conversation with you is like having a conversation with my counterpart. (laughs) I feel very, very connected with you and uh, that the things that I have to share are things not that you're just curious about, but they're things that you live too. And so it's always wonderful to have a conversation with a colleague who not only understands, but uses and embodies the work of breathwork. Thank you, Jim. Jim is my friend, my colleague, my great father. Jim plays a lot of roles in my life, and I really, really am excited, truly excited to talk today. So, Jim, first of all, can you explain to people what breath work is? I mean, you've been doing it for 40 years or more. (laughs) <laughs> yes. It's kind of curious when you use the term breath work because it's so natural. Everyone says, what do I have to work at? I'm breathing all the time. <laughs> but to be conscious of your breath, to be aware of what your breath is doing for you in the moment gives you so much more wisdom and resourcefulness than to unconsciously be holding your breath, to unconsciously have your breath actually become an impediment to your resourcefulness. The truth is, when I first started becoming aware of breath and then using it, in other words, modulating it, I thought I was getting worse. (laughs) (laughs) Literally. For example, I I love to drive. Uh, You know, I'm from Milwaukee, and we have snow, and, and most people are, oh, I hate oh, to I drive Oh, I love in the snow. driving in the snow. I do, too. But when I got in the car, all of a sudden, being aware of my breath, I noticed that I was starting to hold it a little bit. Well, of course, I'm still breathing. We're breathing all the time. But how are we breathing? That's mm. the question. Yeah. Are we breathing in a free, full way such that there is something that we need to be aware of in our peripheral vision, which is a good thing when you're driving. (laughs) Is there something to be aware of in the environment that ordinarily, if I were tense and nervous, I wouldn't? I will be. So my breath is like a 24-hour-7 biofeedback mechanism. And once I tune into it, it becomes very natural to be aware of when I'm slightly holding my breath, when my breath is directing me towards maybe a part of my body that is tense. And then with simple training, it's it's quite natural. We all do it, but we're not conscious of it. I can learn to relax that area, but get messages from parts of my body. And these messages will, again, wake me up to things often that I might trip over (laughs) if I weren't aware of them. Yeah, I have uh, often wanted to coin a phrase that I use quite often, and that is the language of our breath. Once we understand our breath like we understand how to speak English, then we know what's going on with our internal systems. We know like what we're thinking about, how we're feeling, and we also know what's going on around us. And to couple that with the body awareness creates physical healing, with the emotions creates emotional healing, and it also can raise your consciousness to these parts of yourself that just open up and blossom. Creative ideas will start to flow. You'll just have knowings about how to move forward, and things will move with ease. Do you, you know what I'm Do I know? <laughs> <laughs> You're the granddaddy of this No, stuff. that's exactly, it's so beautifully put. Mary Jo, 
Yeah, wonderful. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the sport of it, if you will, is then to learn how to play with the breath because awareness is the first step. And that's it. Yeah. And if, I, if people aren't even willing to be aware, well, okay, end of story. But given that I am willing to pay attention to my breath, it then becomes much more interesting to watch its variations and to modulate the breath. So, well, a recent example in my life is yesterday morning I woke up and I was feeling kind of emotionally distraught. You know, yeah. people say, well, if you're a breath master, then uh, how could you have anything verklempt in your how, life? You how know? could you have real life experiences? <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. And so I laid there and I tried a few of the simple breathing things. Now, the breath is uh, techniques are not to make stuff go away. That's not the point. It's like so that you're feeling in bliss 24-7. Well, if you define bliss as being real, then yes, that's <laughs> true. But if you define bliss as being super exuberant and happy, old, well, maybe not. As you said, that's yeah. not real. So I tried a few simple breathing things. Well, what's going on? And, uh, well, uh, it just didn't modulate easily for me. And I said, okay, come on. You know what the next step is, mm. which is to do a little faster than normal breathing. Because most breathing techniques, when people talk about breathing, they're talking about mindfulness, they're talking about coherent breathing, all wonderful maintenance techniques for breathing. Yeah. And uh, those are things that I recommend to do on a daily basis. However, what I've pioneered in and what I love to teach and train other educators and therapists in is faster than normal breathing, not hyperventilating, not huffing and puffing and seeing what happens, but consciously using a little faster than normal breathing that gets us into our emotional body and allows us then to listen to what those feelings are and to let them flow yeah. rather than uh, as we're trained. I was certainly trained from childhood on if any anger feeling come up oh immediately shut it down <laughs> no we have to be smiley and you know. so it took a long time for me we get called to something in life that teaches us <laughs> before we get to teach it yeah. and i really needed a big education on my emotional self well i think too as you're first approaching those more full higher rapidity breaths that you really should be fully supported by someone who's knowledgeable in the field of psychology, breath work, trauma release. You just want a little hand holding at the beginning so that you know everything is going to be safe. It One thing that I learned from you, Jim, was to always, always make sure that we have a safe environment and that at every moment through the process that someone feels safe. And I'm going to maybe suggest that we offer the audience a very, very safe breath that will connect them and that they could feel, oh, that's what it feels like to feel my breath, just so they can have that experience. So how about if I guide everyone through a circular breath? Would you join me in that? Absolutely. That's always my first go-to before I do any other kind of breath modulation, which is to create the space of safety. You're very correct in that, Mary Jo. And the circular breath is actually... Mm, nothing new under the sun. It's been used for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, some people uh, in some traditions call it the microcosmic orb. You know, no, that's really, fancy. Yeah, right, right. And really, it's simply inhaling up the back of your body, exhaling, exhaling down, down the, the front, front of your body with an easy, continuous breath. So from the base of your spine, 
if you want to join me in doing this, join me and Mary okay. Jo in doing this. Breathe up the spine and down the front. Breathe up the spine and down the front. Breathe up the spine and down the front. Connecting the breath, connecting the in-breath and out-breath, freely flowing, breathing up the spine and down the front. Breathing up the spine and down the front. Breathing up, breathing down. Breathing up, breathing down. Now find your own pace that's not too fast and not too slow. That's quite natural. This is not a breath that you have to do in two seconds or five seconds or just find the natural flow and imagine as you're going up the back you're creating a cocoon of light healing energy breathing up your back and down your front which is your place of safety now if you wanted to take it a step further, you could breathe into your heart area, mm. which is like the inner yeah. sanctum in that space of safety. And there, it's like your private uh, holy place to listen to your own inner guidance. Yeah, that non judgmental place that just embraces the heck out of you. <laughs> yeah. And as you're breathing, simply notice how you feel. What feels different now than when you were five minutes ago? And just notice and know that this is your experience, your creation, and that you did this simply by consciously breathing. Jim, I want to thank you so much for sharing that beautiful experience with me mm -hmm. and with everyone listening in today. Absolutely. I've used this for myself continuously and it's something you can do of course, in your own space of meditation. But it's something you can do also even when you're driving a car, even when you're at a dinner party. In fact, a little more advanced way of doing it is to breathe up the back on the inhale. And as you exhale, extend your breath out in front of you and include someone else. Yeah. We've done that delicious thing several times, haven't we, Jim? <laughs> we have. It is really fun. I encourage everyone to practice it and share it. This is an extraordinary new language that Jim and I would like to send out to the world so that may, like everyone might have a piece of joy in every day. So, Jim... I'm wondering, like, after all these years in breath work, what, what is it that you'd like to be in the global conversation today? Well, breath is the, you called it the language of breath, and that's very aptly put, Mary Jo, because it is the language that unifies all people on Earth. Yeah. To be human is to breathe, to be alive is to breathe. And right now I've had the privilege of doing uh, four trainings in the Mideast. And I don't speak Arabic, but I have a wonderful partner that does and who is from that area and who has found other people who are willing to open up and feel their inner guidance and their inner self. And so we work together, and the same feelings, the same challenges in life, the same 
dreams and expectations are with all humans. And the breath is a language that allows us to learn from one another just by our presence. And so, yes, I do share things intellectually. I do share things uh, technique-wise. I do th share the science behind breath. But our presence, our breathing, loving presence is felt universally even through the technical language barriers that we have. Global inspiration conferences, such as you and I have attended in the past, yeah, coming up here again in the United States. Mm. And to make conscious <laughs> breathing socially acceptable around the planet. <laughs> Just a simple thing to raise consciousness, everyone. Consciously breathe. Right. What an easy no side effects prescription to make the planet a little bit better, Jim. Absolutely, because as uh, world leaders are sitting in a meeting, if they would notice, oops, all of a sudden we're talking about something and I'm not breathing. <laughs> could, you, oh, could you imagine if world leaders sat down and created an intention for the work that they were going to do and then did 100 circular breaths together and then set off doing the meeting. It would take like maybe eight or nine minutes to do that. Well, Mary Jo, what you're talking about actually has been done. Really? Not with world leaders, but with leaders in various professions and with meetings. Uh, whenever we would do meetings for our conferences, we would do exactly what you said. We mm. would start off and we would breathe together. And if it were a week-long conference, we'd breathe for an hour together. It always made us, first of all, in sync with one another. So we're not spending a lot of time when who's right and who's wrong and whose definitions are going to be used. We, as it were, we meld together and it, mm. it doesn't solve all the problems. It doesn't give all the answers, but it makes us uh, much more connected and resourceful with each other. It sounds like this creates like the new sort of collective business model that I've kind of been all about that lately. <laughs> <laughs> That's good business. <laughs> it, it would be a happier world for sure. <laughs> right. And see, it's not, oh, it's a nice thing, and oh, isn't it a goodwill gesture? Actually, it's a very practical thing. It, you know, I think you're really speaking to something there that people might not get who haven't done a piece of daily breath work for for a while, and that is that things unfold more efficiently and easily when you're in balance, when you've taken the time to enjoy a, a few conscious breaths each day for 10 or 15 minutes. When I teach my solid breath work classes, I always give people what I call the 30-30 challenge. I would like them to breathe for 30 minutes a day for 30 days. I don't care if they do it in two-minute segments or if they do all 30 minutes at one clip, but just lay down 30 minutes of breath work. Not physically lay down unless you want to. You may fall asleep, folks, but 30 minutes of breathing for 30 days. And this gets fed back to me that people's lives change. Anxiety is completely dissolved. It's gone from their lives. And I think I have you to attribute to putting that seed <laughs> in my mind, Jim. It's a requirement, actually, to become a breath worker, to do 30 days of 30 minutes of connected breathing in a row. It, it is one of our requirements, because how can you be teaching others unless you've become that intimate with breath yourself? I joke often when people uh, ask about my daily routine and uh, because they say, well, Jim, you, you mean you spend time in the morning doing 30 minutes of breathing? or uh, It's like uh, that's, that's very idealistic and admirable, but I don't have the time. <laughs> well, I, I chuckled because what I discovered, I 
have been a quite busy person in my life. But when I took, I still am actually, but when I take that time to breathe in the morning, and we were talking earlier, you mentioned breathing in the water. We can talk about that. But I breathe in a bathtub. And oh. when I take the time to breathe in the bathtub, I call it my most cost-effective time of the day. Because by doing that, I synchronize my mind and my body together. And then I'm much more efficient. Things that my fear-based self, my mind would say, oh, you got to take care of this. And you gotta, I, no, calm and easy. And I can see the way more clearly to what is, what hits the nail on the head. What gets the job done for the best for all. Yeah, it's what, it just it's incredibly cost effective <laughs> if you use that I term. Think, I think it's that when you're fully consciously connected with the breath, that's what they mean by being in the moment. So you're in mm. this moment, you're consciously breathing, but all those past moments and all those future moments seems seem to like automatically resolve themselves and like you'll just know oh yeah today I'm gonna do this and it'll be the most efficient way you've ever thought to do that this no, that's it, so true because uh, as a psychotherapist of course uh, much of what is dealt with in psychotherapy is anxiety and depression well just as you were saying being in the future is where fear is and anxiety. Stuck to the past is where depression, sadness is held. In the present is where they dissolve. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those are really powerful words. Really powerful words. I have been dialoguing with people through time, and the one thing that comes up repeatedly is anxiety and depression are epidemics on the planet today especially for our young population have you been able to like do any breath work with those lovely grandkids of yours well breath work with children is a little different than breath work with adults and this is what i found early on uh, adults like to have uh, good reasons and they like to have a valid framework in which they can do it. And that's why so much of my talks about breath work are the science of it and da, da, da. And then adults feel safe. Okay, I'll I'll be willing to breathe with you as long as I know that uh, All these it's validations. medically approved. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But with kids, it's more of a playful thing. It, mm. If you can make games with kids and, okay, let's just take some breaths together here and watch what happens. I remember as a kid before I ever knew anything about breath work, you know, you let's hold the breath and spin around, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can go under the water the longest. Right, right, right. It's quite a natural thing to play with it. And if you can do this with children, then it's not a duty or a pr assignment. It's They take it on uh, quite naturally. They start to become... Playful. Yeah, playful and aware with it. And they don't take an hour to do it. Maybe five minutes and they very quickly. One of my colleagues, and I think it, some, you at least heard of Mary Jo, uh, Carol Lampman, mm -hmm. works with infants. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. I had the privilege of interviewing her and she shared with me some of the work that she does with infants before six months of age. Uh, and to release traumas that may have happened at birth and exactly, that kind of Exactly, exactly. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah, and that's amazing. The first person Ooh. to do this was a colleague of mine, Reggie Bame, yeah. uh, who is past now, but I witnessed this, and I was right there to experience it with her, with an infant that had birth trauma. People would bring infants from around the world to her, she just lived through and breathed through her own trauma so she could be safe to do it with infants. Mm. And these infants would let out a cry, and then the parents would report for the first time in their lives they slept through the night. Mm. 
Beautiful. Just it's beautiful. amazing. Wow. What do you think is the most exciting thing going on in the field of breath work today? Well, the thing that actually rang my bell, well, two things now. The first is introducing breathing practices in schools. Yeah. In the educational setting. Actually, one of our original trainers in the Transformations of Breathwork training program was a former school principal. And she had discovered this years before we ever got into teaching formal breathwork together because the naughty kids would be sent to the principal's office. <laughs> and she would have a cot in her office where they would lay down and breathe. Oh, and so they get this... in trouble on purpose so they could go breathe. <laughs> well, I don't know if it went that far, but they, they learned very easily that with some acceptance, they didn't have that anger. They didn't have that need to act out and pull the pigtails or whatever <laughs> that they were doing. So bringing breath to schools and teachers so yeah. that teachers can share it with kids. There's um, one of our students, uh, and you remember him, Mark, who was a librarian in the public schools. Sure. Would have uh, kids sent to the library. And but before they would go looking for books and everything, he'd have a little egg timer and he'd put it over and he said, okay, now we're just going to breathe easily just for a few moments. Mm -hmm. And amazingly, these kids loved it. In fact, he said that at times he might get a little rushed and forget it. And they'd say, oh, no, Mr. G, please, <laughs> we want to breathe first. <laughs> so the second thing now that's really exciting is actually what's being done here in Milwaukee. Yeah. When they have uh, the initiative being led by the Dean of Marquette University and so many other agencies here to the Dean deal of with Marquette University, mm -hmm. you said? To deal with trauma. Oh, yes, yes. The trauma in the city. Now, it's a wonderful, wonderful initiative because they see that poverty in so many things is epigenetic. It's passed on genetically, not just psychologically and emotionally. And using breath can change, literally change, our DNA. Yeah, Jim, you know, I'm going to have the good fortune to be able to dialogue with Anna Silberg. And Anna Silberg is bringing mindfulness, conscious breathing, mm. uh, into the school districts in the Milwaukee area. She has founded a program, created a curriculum, and... Her number one basis is trauma. So you're going to be really excited for that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. Actually, I'm excited for all the things you're into, Mary Jo. You, <laughs> you are like a spark plug. You're out there seeing what is opening up life for people. What is bringing more joy to the planet? And you really have a, a nose for that. Uh, <laughs> That's what this happy hippie healer does, Jim. <laughs> oh, Jim, I just want to thank you for being you. Like, mm -hmm. you have brought so much to my life. It has opened me up in ways I didn't know I was going to open up. And I have to say, people said, go see Jim Morningstar for probably six years before I actually showed up at your door. But when I did, it was quite a journey. Mm. And you showed up at the door bearing gifts, oh, Mary Jo, Jim. because I always say the good teacher is the one that learns from his students. And I have been so appreciative and learned so much uh, in collaboration with you that... Uh, uh, fills my heart with joy. Oh, Jim. Big hugs, buddy. <laughs>